I've been wanting to make a video like this for a long time, probably since before Psychonauts 2 was even announced. Ranking the minds in Psychonauts is a topic I've wanted to go back to for a while, but it didn't seem worth it if I was just re-ranking the same minds in roughly the same order. Thankfully, Psychonauts 2 gave us a whole new batch of mental worlds to explore. Which ones stand out among the rest, and how do they compare to the originals? That's what I'm here to find out today. Just to clarify a few things, I'm not separating Fords and Hollis's levels because it makes more sense to keep them together, and I'm not including Lobato's Mind and Rhombus of Ruin because that's a VR game, so I don't even know how I would rank it. The one disclaimer I will give here is that there will inevitably be a difference of perspective between the levels. Since I've played the original Psychonauts at least five times, probably more, while I've only played two once. However, I did replay the original for this video, and I've 100% at every level in both games, so I have as complete of a perspective as possible. Anyway, let's get right into it. What could the bottom spot be? Well, it's interesting you ask because yeah, okay, it's the meat circus. I've ranted about this level on my channel so many times, it's literally a running joke, but almost a decade of ranting at this point has given me a bit of a new perspective. Oh, don't get me wrong, this level is still terrible and it always puts me in a bad mood, but I really do see what they were going for. It's actually a brilliant concept for a final level. Raz spent the whole game fighting other people's demons and now he's fighting his own. Also, we've seen more and more of Oleander's psyche as the game's gone on, and now Raz gets to the core of it and helps his greatest enemy deal with his childhood trauma. The level has arguably the best music in the game, the aesthetic effectively communicates a mishmash of two things that should not be together, and the reconciliation with Raz's father is heartwarming even if you're not that willing to get invested in it after everything you had to go through to get there. But enough of the good stuff, why does this level get the bottom spot? Two major reasons. For starters, there's the difficulty. Now, in the grand scheme of things, the Meat Circus isn't that hard. I've beaten Crash 4 and played a lot of A Hat in Time Death Wish, and this level is a complete joke by comparison. On my most recent playthrough, I actually beat the Little Oli segment on my first try. The platforming itself isn't that poorly designed, aside from the knife wheels being a bit weird and the Tunnel of Love being legitimately awful. Here's the problem. Psychonauts doesn't have the best controls. They're not terrible, but they're a bit awkward. The game mostly compensates for this by making the platforming challenges relatively easy. Of course, that doesn't apply to the meat circus. This is way harder than anything else in the game, except maybe Thorny Towers, but even that didn't have a time limit. In other words, while it's manageable if you're a 3D platforming veteran, the game in no way prepares you for it. The other main issue with this level is that it feels really lame from a gameplay standpoint. While the other levels were largely linear in terms of your objectives, they were still pretty open, with tons of areas to explore and secrets to find. The Meat Circus is just a straight shot to the end, and a pretty short one at that. You got the Little Oli mission and the Tunnel of Love, neither of which are very long, and boom, it's final boss time. And the bosses range from alright to incredibly boring. Considering how cool the idea of this level was, there should have been a lot more to explore. Also, most of the levels in this game had their own mechanics to to set themselves apart, like Glorious Stage or the Milkman Conspiracy's items. What sets the Meat Circus apart? Being hard. Again, there's so much cool stuff you could do with this concept, but the devs just decided to make overly difficult platforming and that's it. I think that's what really gets me about this level. It's not just hard, it's not just boring, it's a huge mess of wasted potential and it's the last thing you play in this really creative game. When you ask someone what their least favorite level in the original Psychonauts is, you'll probably get one of three answers. The Meat Circus, for reasons I just explained, Lungfishopolis, because of the movement speed, and the most interesting choice, Mia's Dance Party. At first, I didn't see what was so bad about this level, and if you've never tried to get to rank 101, you probably haven't either. You see, trying to complete a Psychonauts game is a mostly fun experience, except for trying to get all the figments, since there are so many 
many and they don't stand out that well, especially in the original. Now, there are a lot of levels that are rough when it comes to figment collecting, but Mia's dance party feels like it's actively trying to torture you. Starting off, due to the bright, varied colors in this level and the decreased figment visibility in Psychonauts 1, the figments blend in here more than any other level, making it so you have to constantly look around and second guess yourself to make sure you haven't missed any. Now, this alone isn't too bad, as you have to do that for a lot of levels, and the first segment is mostly tolerable. But then you get to the race, where you blaze past these barely visible objects that blend in with the scenery. There are a ton of figments here, and a bunch of different routes throughout the racetrack, so you're going to be doing this part so, so many times. It's especially bad because going backwards is pretty difficult, so if you miss a figment, you're either going to have to spend a lot of time backtracking, or go the next round and hope that you see it, which is unlikely because they blend in so much. The final segment isn't any better. The flying figments are awful to collect as they go all over the place, and a lot of the figments in the last room are in absurdly difficult to get to places. Now, it may seem harsh to put a level this low just for the figments, since you don't need to 100% it. But that's not what I'm doing. The figments only knocked this level down a couple of spaces. There are other problems as well. Let's start with the tutorializing. Now, there are barely any explicit tutorials here, but the beginning of Psychonauts has a problem with the first few levels being so basic and hand-holdy, they feel like tutorials, and Mia's dance party is easily the least forgivable of the bunch. It's the third level where it's just someone trying to teach you something, the second time you were pulled out of the brain tumbler to learn a new power, and it doesn't really deal with anything new. Oleander taught you platforming, Sasha taught you combat, and now Mia's teaching you platforming again, but with this cool ball that breaks half the platforming challenges in the game. There's no goal beyond getting to the end and finishing her class. Also, as far as theming goes, Mia's level is one of the weakest. It's a groovy 60s dance party taken to the extreme, which fits with Mia's personality, but isn't especially interesting, at least not compared to most of the other levels. Yeah, there's the orphanage easter egg, but that's just one room, and I'm sorry, that's not enough to save an entire level. In terms of its role in the story, the Brain Tumbler experiment does a lot right. There's a lot of clever foreshadowing with all the meat, the bunny, and the lungfish. Plus, it's cool to see Lobato for the first time. The transition from the static in the caravan to the inside of the egg is also pretty cool and really impressive for a game from 2005. Finally, the fight with the blueprint tank is really cool. The visuals are awesome and the fight plays really well. Oh, and that one vault is delightfully weird. That's about where the good stuff runs out, though. Let's start with the obvious issue with this mind. It forces you to leave and come back twice. Yeah, this largely winds up serving the story, but it's still frustrating. Doing it once might have been okay, but the fact you have to do it twice is a real pain. Honestly, they should have had Sasha pull you into his mind to teach you Psy Blast before going into the Brain Tumbler. It wouldn't have to change much in the story, and it would make things less frustrating. Having to leave to go see Mia could be a legitimate point of suspense instead of feeling like a chore. As is though, the level feels frustrating and tough to connect with because you have to leave several times. Not that it's really worth connecting with anyway. While I said the foreshadowing was clever, from a visual standpoint, this is my least favorite level in the series. It's just a dark forest with some weird stuff in it. It's not even that spooky, at least not in a fun way. Sure, Mia's dance party was a bit generic, but at least it was colorful. For a while, I thought this would be the second worst, but the figments in Mia's mind and the blueprint tank fight just barely allow this really forgettable level to escape the bottom two. Sasha's shooting gallery is probably the simplest level in the game, at least when it comes to the layout, but it has a lot of charm to it. The story is simple. Sasha teaches Raz to Psy Blast, but he won't be able to earn the merit badge until he defeats an absurd amount of sensors. So Raz turns up the intensity until everything gets out of control and he has to put it all back to normal. What's really clever about this setup is the fact that if you go back, Sasha reveals he knew Raz would overload the system, and putting him in a situation like that was part of the test. When you look back at Sasha's dialogue, despite his deadpan delivery, you can hear in his voice when he's putting on an act and when things have actually 
gotten out of control. Sasha's a pretty cool character in general. His introduction to the sensors was good, and the lamp example was hilarious. Although, he has the same lamp in his office in the sequel. So, was he lying about that too? Was it a gift from Mia he didn't have the heart to turn down? Or is Sasha a lamp soon the ray? Anyway, onto the level itself. It's a black and white cube floating in space with calming music, showing how Sasha likes to keep his mind under control. However, once things start going wrong, compartments open up, spewing forth a bunch of random objects as the music becomes much more chaotic. The battlefields these things create are all visually interesting and fun to navigate. But now we get to the part where the level falls flat. The gameplay. It's not bad, it's just not particularly interesting. You navigate each battlefield, shoot a couple of targets, and move on to the next one until you've cleared all four. It's fun, but pretty basic. The level's biggest weakness is its main purpose, the combat. It's all about teaching you the combat, which even the devs have admitted is the weakest element of the game. With a foundation like that, any and all surrounding coolness can only get you so far. Unlike the original, choosing my least favorite minded Psychonauts 2 was kinda hard, but in the end, I had to go with Lucretia's Lament. It's not an outright bad level, but it had a lot riding on it and didn't deliver in the way it needed to. This level takes place inside the mind of Lucretia Mux, also known as Maligula. Ford sealed her memories away to prevent Maligula's return, and now you need to go in, restore her memories, and banish Maligula down to the bottom of the mind where she belongs. The level starts off pretty pretty promising, with a flea circus resembling Raz's family, which is equal parts funny and unnerving, especially with the meat circus music playing. It gives off this charmingly fake look, which represents the fake memories Ford put in Lucy's mind. Anyway, you perform a couple tricks while Ford keeps Lucy comfortable, and then she takes you deeper into her mind, where you see this beautiful quilt world. This part represents the parts of her personality that are actually real, as you take a literal trip down memory lane, seeing the major points in her post Maligula life as Ford explains the context to them. Also, the reveal that Lucy was the one who gave Raz the Whispering Rock brochure, which kickstarted the events of the whole series, is mind-blowing and kinda perfect. This part of the level has some clever puzzles linked to the collectibles, and I cannot stress how good this segment looks and sounds. The landscape is like an HD Kirby's Epic Yarn, and the music sounds like a more calming version of something out of Coraline. It's a great way of communicating that, despite her identity being a lie, she lived a good life and was genuinely happy with the Aquados. Then you get to the ominous lower part of Lucy's mind where Maligula is being held. Fight a bunch of enemies and that's it. That all sounds like a lot, but it really isn't. And that's the problem. Lucy is the main antagonist of this game. Every mind you visited up to this point has connected to her and her actions in some way. And when you finally get into her mind, it's easily the shortest one in the game, assuming you don't count Hollis and Ford's segments as individual minds. I feel bad putting it this low because what we got was pretty good. It just wasn't enough for what this level had to do. Lobato's Labyrinth was kind of a weird experience for me. I was still taking in the fact this was Psychonauts 2 and trying to gauge what had and hadn't changed from the original. That was a tricky state of mind to be in because this is the most disorienting level in the series. I literally started up a second save file to play the level again just so I could get my bearings straight and remember enough to write this entry. I mean, it literally starts with a fake out trying to make you think you're at the Psychonauts HQ when in reality you're in a mental construct designed to get Lobato to tell you who he's working for. The level constantly throws you to different locations to the point where it's hard to establish any sort of connection between them. Plus, it constantly screws with the gravity and there are even mafia teeth for some reason. Oh yeah, I should probably mention the theme. This is a construct Sasha created to get Lobato to tell everyone who his boss is, but it quickly falls apart once Lobato realizes what you're trying to do, so it becomes a mix of the fake office Sasha created and a bunch of teeth, gums, and dental equipment representing Lobato's mind mind until the end where it's a toothified version of the lab at Thorny Towers. They managed to make the teeth stuff just the right amount of gross. Not outright disgusting, but enough to put you a bit on edge. Interestingly enough, the level portrays Lobato in a pretty sympathetic light. He legitimately regrets what he did and wants to come clean, but he's too terrified to tell you who hired him. Also, despite introducing at least twice as many things in this tutorial as in the first game, it's all paced really well, just telling you what to do 
and letting you do it. No drawn out lessons. It's a good tutorial level, but I'm not sure how good of a first level it is. Don't get me wrong. I love crazy levels. That's one of the reasons I love these games so much, but I'm not sure how I feel about it here. Like, imagine if the Milkman Conspiracy was the first level in the original. I don't think you'd be mentally prepared to deal with a level like that right out the gates, and I kind of feel the same way here. I know this sounds weird. I usually complain about games taking too long to get to the action, and now I'm here complaining that they get into it too fast, but that's just how I feel. However, even with the disorientation issue, this is still a fun level, if a bit basic. So after several detours, you finally made it to the end of the Brain Tumbler experiment and found out Coach Oleander's evil plan. What's the next logical step? Terrorize a city full of sentient lungfish, of course. Okay, let me back up. Lungfishopolis takes place inside the mind of a giant lungfish that was mutated by Lobato and mind-controlled into kidnapping children. Ford mentions that it's more afraid of you than you are of it, and that turns out to be right, as Raz manifests as a giant monster in its mind. The entire level plays out like a Godzilla movie. You go around destroying the city and fighting off the army, or navy in this case, as you make your way toward the tower Oleander is using to control this thing. The level does a good job of making you feel like a giant monster. This isn't just a small city. The movement speed and jump height are changed to make you really feel like a giant. And that's the most controversial thing about this level. Some people don't like how slowly you move and the fact you can't use your levitation ball despite getting it recently. To me, I think the movement adds to the experience. Just barely. The level is very linear and relatively small. The only reason it lasts so long is because you move so slowly. I feel like the movement's cool for about as long as the level lasts. Right around the end is where it starts to get annoying, and if it lasted much longer than that, this level would get kind of insufferable. Luckily, Lungfishopolis has a lot more going for it than just the feeling of being a monster. The evening sky and blocky architecture creates a cool look for this level. This is also one of the funniest minds in the game. The resistance you work with is hilariously shady and inept, the citizens have plenty of funny lines about Gogolor, and the newscaster, who's clearly just Oleander, constantly chimes in to announce new strategies the Navy has to deal with you while being insanely biased in his coverage. Buddy, you'll be happy to know that the Navy has decided to pull out what they're most famous for. Airplane! And then the boss manages to combine both great aspects of this level. At the end, you come across Cochamera, a mental projection of Coach Oleander that guards the city. The fight replicates the feeling of a classic monster duel, with Cochamera announcing the ridiculous names of all his attacks before using them. It's a great way to cap off the level. Alright, so we're on to the first of the Asylum Mines, Glorious Theater. This level has a great concept, but the execution is kinda mixed to me. You see, Gloria has a more in-depth backstory than any of the other patients, and as such, it's not just told through the vaults. The first half of the level revolves around a stage that shows different plays, all of which tell the story of various moments in her life. What's really notable about these plays is the mood lighting. You can change the mood of the set, which in turn changes the tone of the plays, either giving you something sickeningly sweet or just sickening, which is a great way to represent both Gloria's bipolar nature and the sheer roller coaster of emotions her life story contains. She went from being sent to an abusive boarding school to becoming an overnight success to cracking under the pressure after her mom committed suicide. You have to navigate these sets and run a few new plays on them in order to get up to the catwalk so you can chase after the phantom. However, despite this great setup, it has some problems. The puzzles involving the plays are fine, but not particularly interesting. Running a play on the wrong set can get some funny results, but I typically don't want to run these things more times than necessary due to the acting. You see, a major plot point here is that the productions are a disaster without Bonita, the spirit of Gloria's youth, and as a result, the acting in these plays is really bad, which is kind of funny at first, but the joke overstays its welcome pretty fast and the line deliveries get really annoying. Also, there are enemies on the sad sets, which makes sense from a story perspective, but they're really annoying. Especially since you're trying
trying to solve a puzzle while dealing with them. The second half of the level is a platforming segment in the catwalks of the theater, and while it isn't as memorable as the first half, it's a lot of fun, combining good atmosphere, fun platforming challenges, and some hilariously self-absorbed quotes from the Phantom. And that brings me to the Phantom's true identity and the best part of this level, Jasper Rolls. He's Gloria's internal critic and the main villain in this level. He manifests as an angry, snobbish critic who hates every play they put on, and he's one of the funniest characters in the game. Both his creatively harsh lines and stuck-up tone of voice are hilarious, which makes for memorable dialogue in the first half. It's like the sight of a horrible car accident. A car accident where the victims can't act and the paramedics forget their lines. And a memorable boss fight. In this fight, he hurls insults at you both figuratively and literally, which makes for a really clever and fun experience. So overall, Glorious Theater was a mixed bag, but it had some good ideas and a few elements that really shine. From one mixed bag level to another, we have Cassie's Collection. This level is probably even more of a mixed bag than the last one because nearly every aspect of it has elements I like and elements I don't. For starters, there's the story, which focuses on a psychological concept I don't see talked about enough. Archetypes. At least, that's what they're called here. Basically, people tend to view personality as a very one-dimensional concept when it's really multi-layered. After all, no one acts the same way in every situation, and across this level, we get to see the various aspects of Cassie's personality. The author slash motivational speaker the world knows her as, the nurturing, helpful teacher she probably acted as around the Psychic Six, the hardened counterfeiter she had to become to survive when she was younger, and the librarian, who took control after the battle with Maligula and decided all of the other archetypes were worthless and she was the one true Cassie. And that brings me to my issue with the story, the librarian. Her motivations make sense and fit with the themes of this level, but I don't think they were clear enough Enough with what she represents. I guess you could say it's her insecurity about not being able to stop Maligula, but that doesn't seem like a side of her personality. Maybe I'm just missing the point, but I guess that's kind of the problem, isn't it? The characters in this level take on a unique papercraft aesthetic, which I also think is a bit of a mixed bag. I was expecting the regular NPCs to at least have a bit of movement, but they're just cutouts from various books with a little bit of waving to indicate they're talking. They do have some good jokes though, in particular the Pretzelmeister's daughter is hilarious. Papa fell into the pretzel machine! Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. Not to worry, it was his secret wish. Really? I think so. That's why I pushed him. It's also nice to see what she thinks of the other Psychonauts, even though it took me forever to figure out how to get up to them. Plus, Cassie's archetypes all look cool and are really well animated, and while the boss is one of the blander ones, it looks great. Finally, the biggest mix factor of all is the setting. I was disappointed by the library. It would probably be cool in a different game. Oddly enough, I was reminded of Little Nightmares when playing through it, but the library setting is pretty dull compared to the other minds in this game. However, the 2D segments of the books are clever and things get so, so much better in the second half. Instead of the library, you travel to a version of the port town Cassie worked in as a forger that's been recreated with books. It's such a cool setting and getting evidence against Fanny Flats is pretty fun. If the first half of the level was as cool as the second, this mind would be a lot higher on the list. As is, it's pretty mixed, but even the worst parts aren't bad, just a little weak. When you think about it, Ford's mind is essentially the brain tumbler experiment of Psychonauts 2. Both of them are minds you return to repeatedly in the first half of the game that end with a major reveal that fuels the second half of the story. But man does Ford's mind do it better. As opposed to being one area you periodically get kicked out of, it's three distinct smaller areas you can do in any order, and a fourth one that gets triggered once you beat the first three. I was originally considering ranking all four of them separately because of how different they are, both in theme and quality, but that would wouldn't be fair or really make sense, since all of them intertwine with each other to tell different aspects of the same story. That story is the relationship between Ford and Lucretia. Going in the order the game suggests, the first segment is Ford's follicles. I think this one is easily the weakest of the bunch, mainly because the first puzzle with the lice is really cryptic. I didn't even realize I could shoot that switch to turn it on, let alone guess it would do something to help when it's that far away. Plus, getting past the windmill is a pain, and whose bright idea 
was it to put a lightning colored figment right next to the storm cloud? Also, while the whole aesthetic of a Grilovian town made up of barbershop equipment isn't bad, it's not nearly as memorable as the other two. Honestly, I would have probably preferred the barbershop level hinted at in the game's first trailer. The storytelling here is pretty good though. It shows how Lucy changed when she went back to Grilovia to help with the war and how her friends, particularly Ford, weren't able to recognize the person she became. The lice were a clever metaphor and this moment in particular really got me. What have you done? Uh, cleaned up the streets? Oh, so peaceful protesters, Lucy one of those unique moments that only this game can deliver. It's funny on the surface until you realize what it actually means. Next is Strike City, which is easily the most unique of the bunch. This one has you rolling on a bowling ball in a city populated by germs inside of a bowling shoe that's about to be disinfected. With all these ideas, the story does take a bit of a backseat. It's about how much Ford and Lucy loved each other, and it's mostly communicated through the billboards and other background details. The ball rolling is fun, the city looks cool, and both the Roaring Twenties aesthetic and the fact it's all about to be wiped out are a clever way to show it was all too good to last forever. Kreller's Correspondence is easily my favorite of the bunch. Honestly, this feels like what the first half of Cassie's mind should have been. Not only is the post office huge, but it's really chaotic with all the letters flying around and the giant mechanical mailman in the middle. The fact most of this takes place in one giant room gives it a nice sense of continuity and the dead letter offices provide some welcome variety. Everything being giant looks really cool and the platforming is a lot of fun. This one has the strongest emotional core of the three, with the plot revolving around delivering a love letter Ford wishes he delivered to Lucy, thinking that if he had done so, maybe he could have stopped her from becoming Maligula. Then, once all three fragments in Ford's mind are put back together, the Tomb of the Sarcophagus begins, which isn't really a level and is more of an interactive story sequence designed to deliver the game's main twist. And it does a pretty good job of it. While the slow-mo falling section is a bit annoying, the atmosphere is tense, and the way they drop the hints is brilliant, with each hint making it incrementally easier to figure out what's going on. As a whole, Ford's mind is easily the darkest in the series. Between the conversations with Ford's alternate selves, the tragic revelations in the levels, and basically all of the Tomb of the Sarcophagus, this mind is full of heavy emotional moments, and I think they were all handled beautifully. I especially like how they handled the twist. What Ford did was bad enough that you can't just write it off as no big deal, but understandable enough for you to still like it. And Raz's reaction is understandably angry, but not so much so that he acts like an idiot and ruins everything. In other words, it shows both characters in emotional lights we've never seen them in, but never throws away what made them likable to begin with. My only issue with the reveal is that I don't think they gave a good enough explanation of why Ford didn't tell anyone about Helmut's brain. All they really needed was a line of him saying he was so distraught he forgot about it, and that would be understandable. But as is, that detail paints Ford in an even worse light than I think they intended. Even still, from a story perspective, this is probably the best mind of the bunch, but when it comes to gameplay, level design, and visuals, it's still pretty mixed, and there are so many great minds that deserve to rank above it. Okay, this one is probably the most controversial placement on the list. I really like Coach Oleander's basic braining. It's one of my favorite tutorial levels in any video game. It has such a great atmosphere, with the entire level being an active war zone. It's super over the top and has a lot of variety too. The main areas all look distinct from each other due to some smart color choices, and there's a lot of stuff to do. There's climbing, swinging, grind rails, navigating a minefield, riding on airplanes, and even hiding from a stream of bullets. Although. I do have to question who thought putting the tunnel of spikes at the end was a good idea. It's not bad, but it's one of the hardest platforming segments in the game. What was it doing in the first level? The mind does a good job of explaining the mechanics to you. The only time it really stops you to explain something is with the various collectibles, and these moments are both short and spread out enough so the game doesn't overwhelm you with information. As for the platforming, it's mostly self-explanatory, but Coach Oleander will let you know what to do in case you can't figure it out. Speaking of which, the level has a lot of personal 
personality. For starters, there's Coach Oleander. He appears all throughout the level taunting you with some pretty hilarious insults, which makes it all the more satisfying when he isn't ready for you when you make it to the end. The campers play a big role here too. Sure, they were in Mia's dance party, but they didn't really do much outside of the race. Here, they feel like a major part of the level, with so many of them doing something specific, like Dogen needing to be guided through a minefield, Clem and Frankie cheering you through the punching minigame, or Vernon telling you a long, boring story before you both get sucked out of the plane. Plus, this level gets even better when you find out the truth behind it. When you finally get the cobweb duster, you can come back and see that Oleander never actually served in the army, which makes this level a bombastic, over-the-top lie. And that's pretty funny when you think about just how far Oleander went making this stuff up, to the point where he put a vault with false information in your path. So overall, this level was a clever misdirect and a great way to start off the game. One of my big hopes for Psychonauts 2 was that the final level would be something big and epic. We didn't get that, but strangely enough, I'm still satisfied. This level starts after you make it through Lucretia's Lament. You're about to help the others take down Maligula, but Truman pulls you out of her mind which is pretty suspicious. Come to think of it, Truman's the whole reason Maligula's identity was uncovered in the first place, and I kinda suspected he was the mole after that reveal. The only thing that didn't add up was the fact he was kidnapped. Raz and Lily also noticed something's up with Truman's incredibly suspicious behavior, so they decide to take a look inside. Yeah, that's right, Lily's helping you out in this level, which is pretty cool considering the last time she and Raz were in a mine together was basic braining. Anyway, you get inside and it's revealed that this obvious obviously isn't Truman. You punch away the statue of Truman to reveal this mind actually belongs to Nick from the mailroom? Or more accurately, Gristel Malik, heir to the throne of Grulovia. This is one of those twists that sounds completely insane when it's revealed, but makes perfect sense given all the clues we've been shown. Nick's brain was missing, Nick looks somewhat similar to the Tsar, and considering the way the Tsar used Maligula as a weapon, the motive for bringing her back is pretty clear. But in case you thought that was the craziest part of the level, we're just getting started. It's funny the last game's finale was a circus because Gristle's mind takes the form of an amusement park ride. The best way to sum it up is It's a Small World if it was written by the Ember Island players. It's an on-rails musical history lesson that tells the story of Maligula from Gristle's perspective. However, the game isn't showing you this perspective for you to sympathize with it. Everything on this ride is a comically wrong and delusional telling of the events. The story is cutesy and funny, but has a weirdly unsettling feel to it as well, giving this level a nice yet odd sense of finality. The level also shuts down any idea that Gristle suffered in exile. His entire family escaped and were still rich enough to live in the Lady Lucktopus and eat caviar all day, but Gristel still felt entitled to the throne, and that's why he put his plan into action. Speaking of which, I think Gristel really works as the villain here. It's nice to have a villain who isn't sympathetic for once, and this is the best way to do it. He's not suffering from some trauma or mental illness. He's an egomaniac who's willfully ignorant to the world around him and dismisses anything that can challenge the idea that he's the rightful leader of Gruul and is destined to return it to greatness. As for the level itself, it's fun to get off the ride and explore around. In a way, it's kind of the opposite of the meat circus. That level looked really big, but was really basic. While this level looks really basic, but there's a lot of exploration packed into this small area. Most of it involves going behind the scenes, and there are tons of areas hidden in really creative ways. Also, I guess the game thinks the singing is annoying and even gives you an achievement for making it stop, but I think it added to the atmosphere atmosphere of this place. The level is a bit short, which is why it isn't any higher, but otherwise it's a clever, funny, surreal, and weirdly ominous experience. Are you a big fan of board games? Well then, Waterloo World is for you. The story surrounds Fred Bonaparte, a descendant of Napoleon and an orderly at Thorny Towers. After repeatedly losing a board game to one of the inmates, he gives up on the very idea of victory and is visited by his ancestor who tries to talk some sense into him. Now Napoleon won't leave Fred's mind until Fred can beat him at that same game. It's an odd yet simple premise and makes for a satisfying story. It feels like you form more of a connection with Fred in his mind than any of the 
other inmates, and seeing him go from a complete defeatist to actually trying to win is pretty satisfying. Napoleon also makes for an interesting antagonist. Unlike a lot of the other mental villains, he isn't actually trying to hurt Fred. It's more like tough love. He wants Fred to stand up for himself and make an effort in life, and is willing to do anything to make that happen. For instance, when Raz asks him about the game, instead of just telling him to go away so he can win, he happily explains the rules, even if he's a bit of a snob about it. Sure, he cheats at the end of the game, but that's likely another test. After all, people don't always play fair in real life, and he wouldn't want Fred to go back to his old ways the moment things got tough. Also, while he's not as funny as Jasper, he does have some good lines. Sacre bleu! I cannot believe it, Fred! You have accidentally done something right! The gameplay in this level is pretty interesting. For starters, it plays with size in unique ways. You start off in a room where Fred and Napoleon are playing the game, but if you jump onto the game board, you enter a larger area where you can walk around on the board and move Fred's pieces. However, in order to get said pieces, you need to go one layer deeper into the world of the game board. Here, you perform various tasks to recruit the pieces for Fred's army, ranging from collecting snails to getting Fred to sign a paper saying he cares if his troops die. The design of this board game world is really cool, feeling like a medieval village, but still reminding you it's a game board with things like the hexagonal floor panels. There are also plenty of points you can enter or exit the board from, so you can get from place to place pretty easily. However, every area of the board is also interconnected, making this the most open-ended world in the game. And it's pretty fun fun to explore. The music is also one of my favorite tracks in the game. It gives the feeling of an army march, and it's really catchy. However, despite all this good stuff here, there are a few issues too. The figment placements can be frustrating, a lot of the birds are tricky to get and require a lot of setup, and the fairy figment is the worst one in the entire game. That and storming Napoleon's castle is the worst platforming segment in the whole series. Except maybe the Tunnel of Love, which arguably doesn't even count because it's just grind rails. It's fairly long, that sword at the end of the tightrope makes it hard to set up a jump to get to the next platform, and it ends with not one, but two segments where you have to glide across a long distance with cannon sensors shooting at you. There's not much you can do to avoid them, and if you get hit even once, you have to start the whole long process over again. This is a fantastic level otherwise, but that one segment makes it an easy pick to put below these next six. I'm just gonna say this up front, I didn't realize Bob's Bottles was about alcoholism until I saw people point it out. I guess it should have been obvious since he's isolated himself out of grief and, you know, the place is literally called Bob's Bottles, but in my defense, the bottle metaphor works in multiple ways here. Let's back up a bit though. The mine starts off with Bob alone on his island, tending to an empty garden. He needs a few seeds to rebuild it, so you go searching for them on this water planet by sailing on your psycho portal and stopping at the various islands. This provides a fun and somewhat relaxing feeling of exploration, especially since the canoe controls are actually good in this game, but it's not enough to carry the level on its own. Thankfully, this ocean is just the glue that holds the main segments of this level together. You see, there are three giant bottles that wash up on shore as the level progresses. Each one has you going inside and doing a good bit of platforming to get to the seed. Each bottle takes you to a variety of locations and the transitions between said areas are great. It seems like a weird thing to praise, but going from a bottle to a kitchen to an oversized garden is really cool when it feels this seamless. All the areas look great, and the platforming is a lot of fun. It's got a unique gimmick, as it revolves around the water and Bob creating gaps in it so Raz can progress. Each bottle also tells its own story about someone Bob lost in his life. His mom, who died when he was just a boy, Truman, who he severed ties with after being fired by him, and the love of his life, Helmet Fulbear, who seemingly died in the deluge of Grulovia. I'll admit, I do wish we saw why Bob was fired, as not knowing why he got canned is kind of distracting, but the story still works without that info. Also, I gotta say, the final bottle is easily the best of the three. The first two are good, but the scope, visuals, and emotional core of the third are easily the strongest. The boss fight can be pretty annoying at times thanks to that freaking moth, but it's not that bad once you get the hang of it, and it's pretty powerful emotionally. I don't really love him. If I did, how could I have left him all alone? Helmet? Helmet would never say that! <laughs> <laughs> 
Having Bob realize he can't keep bottling up his feelings of grief and should try to make new connections with others is pretty satisfying. Also, yeah, his romance with Helmet is pretty sweet. Speaking of Helmet... Psychonauts 2 didn't have a lot of surprises with its minds, as most of them were shown off heavily in the lead up to the game. Out of all of them, the one they pushed the hardest was Psy King Sensorium, and it's not exactly hard to see why. This one takes place inside a random mind Raz found in Otto's lab that he put in Nick's body. Things start going wrong almost immediately, because this mind hasn't thought or perceived anything in a long time, so it needs some help adjusting. In order to get this brain functioning properly, you need to reunite the five members members of Psy King's band, who represent his five senses, and get their instruments back so they can perform a concert, thus processing all the new sensations coming in. It's fitting that the concert is called a feast for the senses because that's exactly what this level is. Well, mostly for the eyes. The music is good too, but I can't exactly taste this level. In all seriousness, this is the most visually striking mind in the series. The bright colors and psychedelic vibe make for a truly memorable experience. It's just so beautiful, and the different areas have so many different looks to them. The bright colors make the figments blend in a bit too much with the environment at times, but that's really my only complaint and it's not a huge deal. The time bubble is introduced here and it serves both as a fun platforming gimmick and kind of adds to the visual experience since it calms down both the obstacles and the colors so you can progress. Another major highlight of this level is the ending. You see, the band members don't just represent the Psy King senses. You notice that he's part of the band and vision sounds and all awful lot like Ford Crawler, and yep, these guys are the Psychic Six, even the body types match up. Helmet's the only one left unaccounted for, and it gets revealed that this is his mind in a fantastic musical number by Jack Black. However, that doesn't mean everything's all good now. When Helmet gets his memories back, that includes the deluge of Grulovia, the feelings of uselessness when his plan didn't work, abandonment when the team left him in the lake, and grief over losing Bob. He can't handle it at first, but Raz and the memories of his friends help him deal with those feelings and show him that things weren't as bad as he thought. It's a subdued yet powerful way to end such a bombastic level. Now for the other mind that drastically changes the art style. Just making this clear up front, I actually prefer the art style of Psy King Sensorium. That's not why I like Black Velvetopia better, although the art style is really good. The Black Velvet painting aesthetic gives the place a unique feel. It's beautiful, yet foreboding in some ways. This level takes place in the mind of Edgar Tegley, a painter who has an unhealthy obsession with bullfights. As a result, most of the level revolves around the bull. The design of this level is essentially one tight, circular street that you have to make your way down any way you can while avoiding El Odio. The variety here is really nice. You go inside houses, swing off lamps, climb up balconies, and hide in back alleys all to avoid this thing. Speaking of the back alleys, they become your main save zones from El Odio, and each one hosts an artist, all of whom sell you paintings to help you progress. Since this world centers around art, these paintings have magical properties. Whenever you hang one up, whatever object is in it comes to life to help you on your journey. You have to use the right painting in the right place, but it's never too hard to figure out and mostly just looks cool. The music in the streets does a good job emphasizing the intensity of avoiding El Odio, and while that tension is nice, the game thankfully doesn't send you too far back if you run into it, usually just to the last back alley or card spot. That reminds me, your goal in this level is to retrieve four playing cards so Edgar can build a tower to get to this girl in the sky, and you do this by fighting several luchadors. While the fights with them aren't the best due to the game's combat system, they are pretty fun by this game's standards. As for the story of this area, it's communicated to you through the dogs. At first, it seems like Edgar was a painter who had the love of his life stolen from him by one of his clients, the bullfighter Dingo in Flagrante. However, after meeting the Dalmatian and exploring the sewers, you see that the real story is a bit different. Edgar wasn't an artist, he was a wrestler whose girlfriend was stolen by the cheer captain, making him lose the state semifinals. But that isn't even the biggest twist. When you get Edgar the car, you realize El Odio is an embodiment of Edgar's rage, and the fight reflects that. It starts off with you trying to kill El Odio, but then Dingo jumps into the ring and you need to take care of him, as he's the real enemy here. And after seeing Dingo and Lampita reduced to such a sorry state, Edgar gets over the whole incident. Edgar, look at them. They're too pathetic to hurt you anymore. Can't you just let it go? How embarrassing. 
I can't believe I was hung up for so long over these losers. A satisfying end to a really fun level. Compton's cook-off seems like a weird mind to put this high up, because it's only one room and has arguably the weakest story of any mind in Psychonauts 2. The story isn't bad, but it's not as emotional, interesting, or even that clear compared to the other minds. As the name would imply, this level is a cooking show where you have to make various dishes for the judges, all of whom bear striking resemblances to other Psychonauts. I guess it ties into Compton's fears about what they think of him, but before going into his mind, it seemed like his issue was sensory overload, not an inferiority complex. I guess Psy King had the sensory overload thing covered, so they needed to find something else for Compton, but this angle is really underdeveloped. I mean, his main insecurity centered around Cassie being gone, and I don't think there's anything in this level that even mentions her. However, once you put the story stuff aside, this level is really fun. For starters, while the story itself is weak, the whole presentation of this being a game show is pretty well done, with the borders and text they put on screen. The judges being puppets is weirdly endearing, and the little food people in the audience are cute and hilarious. Then there's the setting. While it's just one room, not counting the commercial breaks where you fight the judge, this room is big and it's dense. There are four different machines involved with cooking the various ingredients, and each one has its own unique look, hazards, and layout. It feels like they made use of every square inch of this area, as they hid collectibles in every nook and cranny they could think of, which makes hunting for them a lot of fun. Plus, all the chaotic, colorful machinery gives this place a really fun, energetic vibe. As for the actual gameplay, this is easily the most unique level in the game. It kind of feels like a level from the first game with just how different the gimmick is. Since this is a cooking show, the level obviously has you making dishes, and you do this by using telekinesis to carry the ingredients over to the various cooking centers to prepare them in different ways before carrying them back to the stage. This encourages you to really think about what order you should prep the ingredients and what the best routes to take are because you're on a time limit. You don't actually need to finish within the time limit as it just nets you collectibles, but it's still fun to try. Honestly, I wish there were more than three dishes to make. Yeah, it would make the level drag on too long, but I think having some new dishes or even the same dishes to make when revisiting would be pretty cool, but that might just be me having so much fun I want even more. As for the fight with the goats, while a lot of people have problems with it, I enjoyed it quite a bit. The different ingredients force you to pay attention to what you're throwing, and the different attacks are fun to avoid. Yeah, the vomit can be difficult to deal with until you realize you can use levitation to clean it up. Plus, seeing the goats explode after being fed too much is hilarious and satisfying, and I like the weapons they turn into. Once again, I really don't blame you if you disagree with this pick. In some ways, putting it this high feels wrong. So many levels had a lot more content and much better stories, but this level was so much fun and the setting put such a smile on my face, it wound up being one of my favorites. So this entire level revolves around rigging casino games in your favor. That concept's unique enough to be a level from Psychomods. Wow. I was more right than even I realized. But before we get to that, I should start with the setup. Hollis's mind has a really unique focus. While most minds either center around Raz learning something, helping someone with their problems, or both, this is about Raz fixing one of his mistakes. It starts off in Hollis's classroom where she teaches everyone about mental connection, which is a really fun power and this level makes great use of it. Being egged on by the other interns, Raz follows Hollis through her mind to try and make some connections so she'll let everyone come along on the mission to the Lady Luck Octopus. This part of the level has some cool visuals, but isn't especially memorable. Luckily, it's only about a quarter of her mind. Once Raz makes the mistake of connecting risk and money, Hollis takes the gang on the mission, but it becomes clear that the reason she agreed is because Raz gave her the idea that the mother lobe's financial problems can be solved through gambling. So Raz goes in to correct his mistake, and this is where things really start getting good. Hollis's hot streak combines the hospital Hollis used to work at with a casino that embodies her newfound love of gambling. Despite how disparate those two themes sound, they blend together flawlessly. I especially like the adorable Horrible little people made out of various casino and hospital items. Not only do they have good designs, but some of them, like the rich couple and the heart, are pretty memorable. In order to make it through, you need to win three gambling games, all of which are connected to Hollis's insecurities in some way. So you have to go behind the scenes and work your way through these flashy but abstract platforming gauntlets in order to make a few new connections in her mind. These segments look good in a completely different way from the rest
rest of the casino, offer some nice platforming challenges, and teach us a bit more about Hollis, really fleshing her out as a character. Also, suck it, Super Mario Sunshine. This game has an actually good pachinko segment. The interns show up too before getting abducted by this place's boss, Lady Lucktopus, who's one of the better bosses in the game, mainly because of her design. I mean, just look at how flashy she is. Kind of like the rest of this level. Rescuing the interns is nice too, and while it's not technically a part of her mind, the segment where you storm the Lady Lucktopus is really cool as well. Finally, I really like the way the aftermath of Raz's mistake is handled, the quote about fixing people notwithstanding. The scene is pretty emotional and adds an interesting dimension to the situation. What Raz did was pretty messed up and the game treats it that way, but Hollis isn't perfect either and she gives him another chance because she made the same mistake when she was younger, only she wasn't able to fix it on her own. It's a nice extra layer that really ties everything together. Before getting to number one, I should note the biggest difference between the Minds at Psychonauts 1 versus the Minds at Psychonauts 2. The original changes things up a lot, with different gameplay mechanics in each mind, while 2 gravitates toward more standard platforming. This change mostly worked out as when you look at the lower end of the list, mainly the lowest third, most of the minds are from the first game. However, the experimentation also gave an edge to the better Minds at Psychonauts 1. Maybe that's why nothing could top the Milkman conspiracy, it's just so unique. This level takes place inside the mind of Boyd Cooper, probably the craziest character in the entire series. He's a guard outside of Thorny Towers and a massive conspiracy theorist who constantly rambles about a figure called the Milkman. So you go into his mind to find said Milkman, and what waits inside is truly insane. It's a 1960 suburb that's been twisted like a Mobius strip. The music tells you something is seriously wrong, and everything from the windows to the fire hydrants is watching you. However, the most important thing watching watching you is the G-Men, who make up this level's main gimmick. They're looking for the Milkman, and if you stand inside their perimeter, they'll take you into questioning. That is, unless you can blend in, which is pretty easy since these guys are idiots. Each group of them is holding a specific object connected to whatever job they're pretending to do, and all you need to do is hold that same object to blend in. You find them in various areas of the level, which gives it a borderline Metroidvania vibe. Speaking of the G-Men, they're the funniest characters in the series. The contrasts with them are just great. They have these twisted, creepy appearances, but they're constantly doing ridiculous things with the objects they're holding. They have these monotone, borderline robotic voices that are used to deliver some of the strangest lines in the game. Some of what they say is normal, but a lot of it is these really strange, yet obvious lines about their jobs that are just made better by their voices. And even when they say something perfectly normal, it's still funny. These guys aren't the only sources of humor, though. Boyd's conspiracies are hilarious, and this level has the most famous line in the game. I am the milkman. My milk is delicious. The plot of this level is also great, but for different reasons than most of the others. It's not an emotional journey where you help a character fight their own demons. It's an intense mystery that makes no sense whatsoever. The clues have no logical progression, and it ends with a bunch of Girl Scouts guarding Boyd's true personality, the milkman. And how does the milkman react when woken up? Easy. He blows up everyone. The Girl Scouts who were guarding him, the G-Men who were looking for him, and even the censors who were supposed supposed to be regulating his mind. Everything is so complicated, it's tough to say which side are the good guys and what they represent, but you can figure it out if you really try, and I think that's pretty cool. Finally, I want to end this entry with a little story. When I first played Psychonauts, this was actually the level that gave me the most trouble. Yeah, not the meat circus. This was for two reasons. One, this is where you started needing the cobweb duster, and I didn't know how to use the dowsing rod properly, so I wound up grinding arrowheads for it in this level. Then immediately after clearing that roadblock, I ran into another one. You see, the computer I originally played this on couldn't properly process the filters used for the confusion grenades, so whenever I got hit by one, I couldn't see anything. I didn't realize anything was wrong at first until I got to the part with the security cameras, which had the same problem. I was eventually able to make it through, but it took a long time, and for a while, I thought my playthrough was doomed. Why am I bringing this up? Well, for starters, I thought it would be an interesting way to end this, but it also makes an important point. Despite all of this frustration, I still really enjoyed the Milkman conspiracy, and the fact I was willing to put in all that effort to finish it and like the level in spite of that hassle is really special. I am Defofalizer, and thank you for watching. If you made it this far, be sure to like this video and share it with as many people as possible, and subscribe for future uploads. Also, a big shout out to Double Trouble 154 and the SMR for supporting 
supporting me on Patreon. If you want to get shouted out like this or see my videos a day early, be sure to support me there too. Link is in the description. Bye!